This is JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Carl Sketchley, and on behalf of the team here at JSA, thank you for joining us as we continue to navigate our way through COVID-19 and its effects on our industry. These JSA virtual roundtables serve as a timely platform for us to seek advice and information from top industry thought leaders. For the next 45 minutes, we'll face the latest challenges of today's reality together as one network infrastructure community. Also, as a little sunshine hopefully at your door today, we have provided lunch or if you chose a gift card to a local restaurant for the first 100 registrants. So for those of you who received, please enjoy your JSA lunch while we get started. And a quick reminder, this is a roundtable. We do want to hear from you and answer your questions. So please go ahead and type your questions into our question box. Time permitting, we will answer them here. But in the last 15 minutes of the hour, we will take our conversation over to LinkedIn for a chat with our speakers. Either search for hashtag JSA virtual roundtables and our feed will come up or click on the direct link we will share in our chat box shortly. Once there, we will be reviewing the questions we don't get a chance to cover in the next 45 minutes. And you can post your own questions and thoughts to our panelists there as well. This is JSA's sixth roundtable in a series of necessary conversations right now on redefining communications in the wake of COVID-19. Our next one up will examine how we should be safeguarding our network infrastructure in today's brave new world. That roundtable is July 30th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Check it out on jsa.net and register. Now, let's get started. Today's topic, redefining communications in the wake of COVID-19. For today's chat, we have over 240 registrants joining us. Thank you for your continued support of this series. And thank you to our panelists for dedicating their time for us today. To help us introduce them and to guest moderate, please welcome Rosemary Cochran, Principal and Co-Founder of Vertical Systems Group. Rosemary, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Carl, and um, welcome to all of you joining us today to hear from this exceptional roundtable of industry experts. We're going to be sharing their perspectives on network communications in these really unprecedented times. Um, three kind of big picture points to start from, from my perspective and, and also uh, this, these are things that we've shared um, with, together with the, uh, with the panelists. First, communications has never been more essential. Um, through all the daily disruptions that we've been enduring um, caused by COVID-19 and the, um, you know, have to mention as well the suffering from the tragic loss of loved ones through this. Um, one of the most critical lifelines that we've had has been the ability to stay connected to one another across the world and um, really virtually on demand. Second, making this happen is largely, um, in my estimation, underappreciated. In other words, um, I'm sure the, those of you in the communications industry and have had friends and family think that it all just works and it should work and there shouldn't be any interruption and it should always be um, as fast as they want. But you know, consider how the resiliency of the underlying global communications infrastructure, including terrestrial and subsea, um, has been and continues to be stress tested by what's going on. We've had unexpected surges in demand, um, uh, abrupt shifts in traffic patterns and usage. Uh, we've had um, cyber attacks. There's uh, a lot going on with staffing and supply chain issues and more. But through that all, um, you know, what is the reality is that the communications infrastructure, which by the way, enables all of those cloud apps that everybody uses and it wouldn't work without it, has um, been working remarkably well. Third, the new challenges are going to keep coming and the wake of COVID-19 is surfacing and we need to consider what we're calling the new realities ahead. So let's dive in and um, I'm very pleased to introduce you to our speakers 
and those are Gil Santelis from NJFX, Hunter Newby and Newby Ventures, Joe Scadarigia from Windstream, Nigel Bailiff at Aquacoms, and Octavia Hernandez at Gold Data. Um, notably, I'd like to just recognize three of these gentlemen, Hunter, Joe, and Nigel, were just named to Capacity Media's Power 100 list of the most influential ind individuals in the wholesale carrier community. So congratulations to you for that. Um, Thank you. So next, I'd like to introduce you to each of the speakers, and they'll tell you a little bit about their role in their company. And um, we can start with um, the top with Nigel Bailiff. Hi, thanks very much, Rosemary. Hello, everybody. I'm Nigel Bailiff, the CEO of Aquacoms. Aquacoms is an Irish-based uh, infrastructure developer of submarine cables. We focus totally on the beach to the beach, or certainly the first building to the first building. We work in collaboration with uh, a whole range of, of partners on the fixed uh, terrestrial network side, and we are a carrier neutral, but carrier's carrier player. I've spent about 32 years in the submarine cable industry through various guises, starting with cable and wireless back in the 80s. Uh, for me, it's something which, you know, connecting countries together enables all of the other layers of communications to work, from the applications all the way through to social media. Um, I think it's fascinating to be able to work with parties like members of the panel across the oceans to make sure we're delivering these vital services for everybody throughout my entire life communicating with home you know with a young family has been facilitated by all of the work that goes on in our international communications uh, um, sector okay thank you um hunter you uh sure. hunter is the um owner and entrepreneur i should say that uh nigel was the ceo of our aquacoms i think i I neglected to say to actually introduce you officially, so uh, I apologize for that. Um, Hunter is um, the owner and entrepreneur for VOB Ventures. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, thanks all, fellow panelists, for and uh, and JSA. Shout out to Jamie and uh, David Capri. Um, my name is Hunter Newby. I own Newby Ventures. Newby Ventures is a holding company I formed a few years ago. Uh, to hold various interests um, in different entities that I've uh, founded, invested in, partnered in, um, and uh, started a lot of companies in the space, network, neutral infrastructure uh, businesses. Um, I continue to do so. Uh, I'm partnered with Gil and NJFX, so I'm happy to have Nigel and Aquacoms as a, a customer in, in two facilities. Um, and. Uh, Look forward to uh, this panel today. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, next is Octavio Hernandez, who is the Director of Global Business Development for Gold Data. Octavio. Uh, there you go. Thank you very much. Um, hi, all. Um, yes, my name is Octavio Hernandez. I'm the Global Business Director uh, at Gold Data. Uh, basically, what we do is we are a wholesale company. We have presence in uh, 37 countries now. We uh, do connectivity from and to uh, the United States, covering Mexico, Central America, and South America. Uh, basically, we've been doing uh, business uh, for the last 20 years, and I've been involved in telecommunications uh, for the last 26. So. It's been a crazy journey. It's been an amazing uh, race of uh, telecom. So um, uh, this roundtable is going to be super interesting. Great, thank you. And uh, this is Joe Scadaregia from Windstream. He is Executive Vice President of Wholesale Solutions. Thanks, Rosemary. Thanks for having me, and very happy to be uh, part of the panel today. So uh, you know, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm the Executive Vice President at Windstream Wholesale. Um, for those that don't know, Windstream is a Fortune 500 company. We, we primarily provide services throughout the U.S. We have three business groups, three business units, consumer, enterprise, and wholesale. Um, my group um, primarily runs the wholesale business unit, which consists of sales, marketing, which includes the product, um, business development, and also expanding of the network. 
Thank you. And Gil Santelis at NJFX. He is the CEO and founder. Great. Thank you, Rosemary. So, yes, I'm the founder and CEO of NJFX. And NJFX is North America's first carrier neutral cable landing station campus. That's a mouthful because it is. It's, it's really two buildings at the moment with additional property that can host up sea cables. Today at NJFX campus, we have four subsea cables, one currently going live soon, um, but we have one going to South America connecting New Jersey to Brazil, down to Sao Paulo and Praia Grande. Two cables that were put back in the ocean back in the early 2000s that Tata owns that connect New Jersey with the UK. And then we have the uh, Hafru NEC2 cable that Nigel is the landing party for that connects New Jersey to Denmark, Ireland, and Norway. Um, what we did basically is create a community, a community of interest of subsea providers. We could have a home to work within to uh, monetize their assets and have an on and off ramp interconnecting North America to their countries. And what we collected in New Jersey is 20 five plus carriers that now are best of breed at doing what they do and that's getting the subsidy capacity across North America and beyond. So in essence it's a new generation hub. It's a real true application of how you can interconnect networks effectively uh, with the best architecture and cost effectively especially in this market. Mm -hmm. Great. Excellent. Well certainly can see this is uh, this is the best group to talk about uh, what's going on in uh, communications infrastructure. And uh, we're going to get into some of the new reality questions, but um, to start, there's uh, a section that um, has come up because of the conversations that we've had about things that are being driven by COVID-19 and, um, and across a lot of different areas, including um, sports, medical, service delivery, so I'm um, going to take a couple of minutes and, and talk through those. Um, starting with Octavio, who has an interesting story about um, sports. And um, you've all been laughing at me, but you know, we're coming from Boston. We're very sports deprived here. So we're, you know, we'd love to hear the sports stories. Um, although this one is not as, not as uh, you know, happy. <laughs> hey, so, uh, thanks, Octavio. Um, well, we as a um, telecom company, we have connectivity uh, via our uh, capacity that we have over 11 submarine cables, and that gives us the ability to connect all these venues around uh, Latin America. It was very interesting because uh, a market that wasn't um, as connected uh, as uh, all these big companies and all these big, big broadcasters would like to be uh, via fiber. Uh, now that now they were connected, so uh, we were doing very well. All the games were uh, having a great moment because people would be experiencing a high definition delivery um, just in time, uh, milliseconds uh, of delay. So basically a live event and with the COVID-19 within a weekend, all the soccer games, rugby, cricket, WTA, PPP, basketball, football, everything shut down. So uh, it was, uh, it, it was a big, a big announcement that we, within uh, two, three days, we calls and calls and calls canceling all these events and you could imagine having all this staff connectivity uh, cables switches uh, everything deployed to make the games happen and within three days everything was shut down so so quite quite an event we are still um, trying to, to 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 really understand what happened and how this, not only our industry was affected, but all the food chain within um, the business, because this affects everybody involved. Right, right, up, up to the networks that are distributing the, the feeds, right? 
Exactly. You know, the network agreements, the cross connections, the capacity agreed uh, to the owners of the stadiums, the players, the coaches, and all the industry that lives around uh, a sport game event, a live event. Um, we used to have 60 to 150 games per month. Suddenly, everything international, national, local everything gone yeah. well i could also add we had the connectivity to bring the olympics to latin america we yes. were uh, doing all these connectivities i was uh, ready to knock on jill's uh, office and say jill we need to bring on this cable because we have all this traffic coming to latin america and so guess what no more olympics mm -hmm. yeah. what's if up I, if what's i could just Fabio is sharing. So got yeah. to know Fabio the last few months. As a matter of fact, we were together in Brazil when this outbreak happened, and we were almost stuck in, in Brazil because of the outbreak. Mm -hmm. But I've gotten to know the Gold Data platform, and it's extraordinary what they've built. They've built a broadcasting engine that can serve a global need. And yes, the world is on pause, but it's a pause. The desire for all of us to want to see events and be part of events has not gone away, and we're collaborating with Gold Data on very unique applications between Latin America and Europe, which all the infrastructure that we collectively on this panel do is enabled by, by what, what gold data can broadcast. So it, it, I think it's a pause for us, you know, Octavio, I think we're gonna find new applications as you kind of shared before, there was a concert that people wanted to see and they're gonna kind of make it happen anyway. It's kind of a way of having to all reinvent ourselves and that's what's happening. Everyone reinvent themselves. Yeah, yes. someone's muting. Yes. <laughs> All right. That's um, yeah. So thank you, Octavia and Gil, for for that. It um, it does kind of uh, you know, speak to the ripple effect of what's going on. Lots of things are happening, and then new things happen, which is a good lead into um, the next uh, story, the worst story from um, Hunter, which is more medical related about COVID and. Um, the innovation that is, has come out of, of this crisis. Yeah. Share yeah. that with us, Hunter. Sure, certainly. So um, although my history is really building network neutral infrastructure, carry hotels, meeting rooms, that sort of thing, dealing with the subsea and terrestrial fiber network. Um, after I formed my holding company, I started making investments in things that were not necessarily directly physical network, but related to network infrastructure at the higher layers. So I made an investment in a a blockchain company uh, that built a platform for supply chain management. Uh, the company's called Citizens Reserve and the platform's called Suku. And a couple of the original um, applications for uh, blockchain distributed ledger technology, uh, which all relies on the infrastructure that we build and, and own and operate and maintain every day. So that's the fun part. But uh, the uh, one of the original applications was to track um, beef effectively uh, cattle from the farm to the store. So um, they, the super guys did a deal with Senko Sud in Latin America, which is a big retail supermarket chain. Um, so they had built out this whole platform to track things and basically products that go through the supermarket. And then COVID happened. Um, and I'm skipping over a, a big part just for time purposes, but um, the Suku guys had a deal with a company called Smart Track which manufactured RFID and NFC tags. And SmartTrack was acquired by Avery Dennison last year in November. And Avery Dennison is a Fortune 100 company. You probably know them from office supplies like labels and things like that. Um, so when COVID happened, um, there was a big need uh, for test kits. I think we've all heard about testing for COVID like ad nauseum. Uh, probably the only other thing we've heard more about is ventilators as it relates to uh, COVID. Um, but immediately with the need for test kits, there's so many different sources of test kits, um, almost instantaneously um, there were fake test kits being made. Literally companies were copying and pasting, um, you know, barcodes and 
uh, UCs and, and, and other um, you know, standards based information than just printing it on packaging and selling fake test kits. Um, it became a big problem fast. Um, so this blockchain platform, Suku, um, in conjunction with Avery Dennison, um, and there was a press release about this, so I'm sure you'll be able to find that after this uh, panel. Um, started to apply the NFC tags with the blockchain um, to test kit packaging uh, for multiple purposes. First is authentication, to authenticate that it's actually a real test kit. Um, and then for uh, traceability and tracking of uh, the, the person that was tested and the test results. Um, you know, one of the sort of byproducts of the initial, you know, COVID situation was that everyone was obsessed with the number of cases and then the number of cases that were positive and then what the result was, you know, did the person live, die, recover or whatever. And there were probably three sources of data um, at least World Health Organization, CDC, and Worldometer for those people that were checking that source. And there was never a day that all three had the same numbers. So it's a little frustrating uh, because no one had accurate data. So um, here we are now uh, with Suku being applied uh, with the tags uh, so that the data can not only be uh, accurate, but collected in real time and reported. Um, so I think maybe this situation that we all just passed through, you know, was thrust upon everyone. Um, and hopefully, you know, this subsides soon. Uh, we'll see. But we'll all be better prepared for the next whatever it is, because uh, uh -huh. something's bound to happen. And um, we'll be able to collect and track data um, uh -huh. and have real information reported and, and not cause panic and fear and hysteria. Um, yeah. That we had to live through. So, anyway, that's right. that's what happened. Now. <laughs> right. So that's a little different different kind of angle, but definitely um, in terms of innovation and the things that are coming out of this, that you know, some of the lessons learned. It's um, you know, it's very interesting to to see what happens and and the amount of time that it took to you know to reinvent that um, was. Uh, you know, faster than it ever would have been if it had been planned as a product from start. Completely. So, totally. uh, there wasn't, yeah. It was not thought of or planned for. It was a pivot on the part of multiple companies, large and small, to create right. that solution and apply it to that problem at that time. It came together relatively quickly. But I think everybody had to figure out how to mobilize data centers, submarine cable systems, terrestrial fiber networks. Everybody yeah. was pushed to work at home and, you know, mm -hmm. we're all now using, you know, go to webinar and Zoom and Teams and, you know, lives yeah. have just changed dramatically in you know, just a few short months. Exactly. And that's a good uh, lead into the next one, which is more kind of, you know, it's a, call it nuts and bolts, Joe, but Joe is going to talk about uh, service delivery and prioritizing kind of the essential or deemed to be essential COVID related installs. And what you had yeah. to, to get that to happen. Yes, yeah. yeah, so Rosemary. One thing that we uh, that we learned very quickly. And, you know, I represent you know, which is basically service providers, right? Um, you know, we know we, we we realized very quickly that the, there was a demand for the for the services that we offered. Whether we were, um, you know, we have three, businesses, but but across the business lines, you have consumers that were pushed to the home uh, that needed uh, either. Um, some didn't have connectivity to the internet or broadband so there were new users and then there was those that had it that needed increased speeds uh, so the consumer group there was demand for that from a business standpoint when people went from you know moved from the work at work to the work at home you had um, you know the networks making sure that they had their VPNs and bandwidth into the VPNs and enough connectivity for people to connect to the corporate networks and then, as we just mentioned, the, there was others that that had to implement some sort of video technology, whether it was Zoom or or Teams or whatever. All that required, you know, bandwidth. From a wholesale standpoint, what we provide we provide companies, cable companies, content companies, gaming companies with capacity. We saw very quickly that there was a demand for the services, and and it was core transport or internet type of capacity. But what we also learned very quickly is that that from a service provider, the services were were in demand. We weren't immune to the situation that was going on because 
some of the equipment manufacturers were seeing some supply chain challenges, uh, you know, as you know, for the components for their services. So, you know, service providers, services, but on each end, you usually require equipment. So from an optical, uh, from a core networks, in many cases, you need an optical card, right? Even if they have a system built and those cards require components and those components are built in factories all over the world. And in some cases, uh, those factories were shut down. So, so we, we learned that pretty quickly. And what we did on our end, um, you know, a couple of things, uh, you know, I think a lot of companies did it. We worked closely with our uh, equipment manufacturers to try to, um, to, to try to order services, even though the services weren't necessarily in demand at the moment, just try to get a, a more aggressive forecast to get um, on their end, uh, equipment ordered and manufactured so that we could use it, you know, very, very quickly in the, in the future. Uh, and then, you know, we also learned very quickly is that um, the technicians weren't able to necessarily get out to the to the field to get to the data center to get to the end user's office. So um, what we did on our end is we put together some um, what I would call emergency type services for COVID type. So customers that needed a, 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 a circuit for Internet connectivity as it related to COVID, they were labeled inside of our company and we um, we prioritized those and some of them. We got in very, very quickly. And you see inside companies, and our company isn't huge, but we have almost 12, 12 and a half thousand employees. When you label one of these orders or service uh, that it's COVID related, want to help fulfill a need in the marketplace, people, people bind together to try to deliver the services. And we did see that quite a bit uh, inside our company. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Um, so there's a lot going on, a lot of uh, new reality kind of redefining, reinvesting, looking at the future. So um, there are lessons learned and um, I'd like to start off with like, what do we know for sure? Where, where is this going? What are the things that uh, either surprise you or you think um, we really need to focus on um, to start at? So let, um, Gail, you wanna start with that? Sure. I mean, just to echo what Joe shared before, we're still going through this. It's not over yet. We're on Code Orange. We've been on Code Orange now for three, three and a half months. And that means we're very selective on who comes to our facility. We've got strict guidelines. We've got international carriers that cannot get their employees into the U.S. to service their equipment. We've got large OTTs that cannot bring their techs into New Jersey to service their equipment. And we're doing all that work in-house for them now. And luckily, it's going smoothly. But we also have stage two. We've got protests happening in our country. Um, our major cities are going through major challenges. Um, aside from the protests, you know, they're not going to be the same for a long period of time. If you're in a major metro environment, the idea of using mass transit is something that is not appealing to most employees. Um, getting into high-rise buildings with elevators and having to manage how do I get up and down stairs when I'm only allowed to go to an elevator at a time. And, and that in the entire industry because right, wrong, or indifferent, 20 years ago, um, global networks went to major metros, Miami, New York City. And those are not the places you want to be right now with your tax. That's not where you want to have your critical assets hubbing through. Um, you know, we built NJFX as trying to get ahead of what we saw were natural disasters. They used to be Hurricane Sandy for us. It used to be 9-11. We never had on the radar pandemic and uh, uprising, social unrest. Now we've got those that we're dealing with. And we're getting ready for hurricane season because sure enough, it started this month. So, you know, the stars are aligning in ways that we never quite imagined. And, we built a facility that was purpose built. It wasn't repurposed as a something else before an office building or a warehouse. It was a tier three data center with subsea ducts, with backhaul, with a community of interest. And the lesson learned is we've got a plan. We can't just try and save our way to prosperity. Um, I think going forward, the lesson learned is outages are customers' faults. They're not providers' faults. Right? Providers provide a service that they can give you in a predictable manner. It's not guaranteed to always work. If you want it to always work, the customer is responsible for making the plans to have backups and resiliency within their architecture. 
And that means diversifying their network carriers, their hubs, having that resilience put into it. I think the lessons learned are still coming fast and hard. I think this fall will be an interesting time as we start to see the true push on the networks that happened the last three months. It's great that all the carriers got a full load of new orders, but how did those orders come in? They used all of their supplies that were in spare to put the customers up and running. Now you have the customer running at an 80% utilization. There's no more room to grow. So I think lessons learned are still to come. I think there'll be those that are prepared, those that weren't prepared. And I think over time, people will pay for value again when they know that it's a rock solid solution. Interesting. Yeah. Imagine you want to add to that as you've uh, had similar types yeah. of things on the table. I think, um, you know, we're, 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 the very fact that we're talking on a medium like this means that we, we didn't screw up, right? So, um, you know, that, so I'm I'm here in the UK. You guys are all, you know, we're dotted around the planet. We're communicating daily using these kind of uh, methods and mechanisms. Why is that? Some of it's about design. Some of it's about anticipation. So in some ways, we looked at general disaster view and we thought, okay, business continuity. All these things that we've learned over successive problems. We had the, you know, ten years ago, the Icelandic volcano that stopped flights all around Europe. That created a similar, smaller kind of problem to, to address. We're very good at addressing problems in our industry, and we're actually quite good at collaborating and being cooperative. But I think taking the view a little bit further forward, one of the things that we're we're going to see, in my view, is a real scrutiny of supply chain. We've always we, we've a, a, a kind of unique organisation in Aquacoms. We 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 rely a lot on uh, what I call intelligent outsourcing. So we keep a lot of the knowledge base and 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 process and, and intellectual piece inside the company, but we we outsource various activities. And so we're used to cooperating with other people. And in our international telecoms arena, you have to cooperate with other people. You've always had to cooperate for the last hundred years in able to traffic to flow across national boundaries. So we're kind of predisposed towards it anyway. But the big globalization that's occurred and supply chains that are really kind of thinly strung out to the one or two factories maybe in Asia that makes this tiny component that goes in every motor car and that was suddenly you know woof that stops along with all the other things transport stopping etc cetera, etc cetera, you know really has made everybody sit up and think I think we're in great shape as an industry because we we think like this if you if you've had anything to do with the network for the last 20 years you know that you net one is none and two is one, right? That's a rough, a rough calculation. You need three to be sure that you're going to have a decent service, and maybe four to ensure that you're going to have a large volume service. So, all of that has taught us to make sure we collaborate. If I have something on my cable, I have something on the next door cable, and maybe the next door again. If we have buildings, we have more than one. We have, you know, resilience in power supply fuel supply, all these different things that, you know, Gil's done really well in his building there in New Jersey. And the, the thing is, it's the arrangements that we're going to have to make going forward to perhaps think about whether this happens again or whether there's a long tail to this, whether it means international travel is, is stopped for quite a considerable time. Mm -hmm. um, we're just going to have to think about business arrangements differently. I'm quite happy if somebody's got facilities nearby my facilities and I've got people who I put in those facilities it, they're not busy every hour of every day there's going to be an ability to share resources under some kind of uh, banner of activity and we're just going to have to get better at cooperating and that's going to drive a little bit of localization and specialty and what what we do in the submarine cable side is we build the you know the the bedrock kind of the even underneath the rails of the railway, you know, we're building the, the permanent way that all that data flows across. So we just have to be very open about who we supply it to and very open about who we collaborate and cooperate with um, for it to be resilient. In just one point, I'll say we're laying cables at the moment. We're building a cable across the Atlantic. The effect of COVID on that was, was zero because the ship was at sea, it had cable in the ship. The last thing they wanted to do was to come into a port and interact with 
all these unclean people, you know, in, in, on land. Uh, and the ship stayed at sea for 116 days. All it did was pick up fuel and food, and it carried on and delivered its um, delivered the cable. Now, when it comes to changing out the crew, we get complexity of quarantine and you know all these kind of different local laws. But by and large, even the delivery of projects that are due for delivery later in the year carried on. My thought, really, and we should discuss perhaps, is what about developing new things? We haven't got together around a table. We haven't got together and thought about what's the next thing we want to do. So the early phase of projects has been really difficult in COVID, but you know, carrying on with existing networks and, and to some degree building additional ones, no problem. Yeah, hey, and I just to add on to what he said, uh, Rosemary, I think I think the lesson learned, he hit it on the head, what, it, certainly supply chain is going to, that's going to be impacted and how we look at that across many industries, whether it's medicine or whatever, but in our industry, those components is a big piece of it. And I think you'll, you'll start to see bigger partnerships, more communication between whether it's a service provider, a cable manufacturer, a data, you know, a, a co-location company on what it is that the future plans are going to look like. I don't know anyone that's going to necessarily look ahead and see what the next pandemic is. I think the only one thought we would be here is probably Bill Gates. He was the only one that was probably, you know, predicting this would happen. But outside of him, none of us were really ready for this. And, and I think we're managed around it. But when you look ahead, I think really good communication with your customers on what, what it is that they're going to need, not only now, but in the future, so that you can plan around it. You can plan your network, your data center, your cable system, your products, whatever it is. And then you can kind of communicate that out. To, to those down the food chain that are going to be impacted, who's providing the equipment, who's providing the network, who's providing the edge device. And I, so I think pr proactive planning, you'll see much more of that um, throughout the business moving forward. Yeah. And, uh, and that's exactly right. I think what we're experiencing now from um, the customer standpoint is they're not sure what's happening. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to plan when you don't know if you're going to have all of the people working at home that were forced to work at home, if they're all going to come back to the same you know, locations or whether that's going to be shifted to a new model, which requires new things. So, um, and new applications and new kinds of, um, you know, connectivity. So, does anyone want to address well, that? And I think uh, I want to point out that uh, the exercise of remote work, it, it, it was a global exercise for everybody. And we saw that it works. Actually, people is doing more. They're more productive. Then, then that's not an issue. The, the, the problem is the, the, the daily activities of, of, our, of uh, the human beings on different countries trying to have a life you, you, you used to work and then on the weekend watch that soccer game stadium having fun with your family and friends now you cannot do it going to the movies you cannot do it, it you, you know certain parts of the of our uh, operation of our businesses they still work they they go ahead but the, 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 the rest of, of the planet, that they don't deal with cables, fiber, and black boxes, mm -hmm. they live in another reality. And uh, that's, that's the challenge. How am I going to get people together to, to enjoy a game now? How mm -hmm. am I going to deliver that? So we are now we are in the fast track to come with new solutions, new alternatives, for people to enjoy, to have access to that. So that uh, on our side, that's that's the challenge. Yeah. Putting a copy on the spot, there was um, I was on a call last night about another major conference that is looking at whether to have their event or not have their event. And um, I brought up Gold Data just because I said this particular venue is unique that we love to go to an annualized basis. This event in the middle of the Pacific Ocean is a place that in January we all love to spend time. Wouldn't there be a way for those that can go to go to this conference and the rest of us to use a broadcasting platform, not just to see the panels, but to go to the nighttime events and feel like, you know, I got a taste of Hawaii in January 
um, have someone with a microphone walk around and broadcast what's happening there so that we don't forget what it's like to interact with each other. Um, it, this is going to be a moment in time, as we all hope, but I think broadcasting is a great application and to have new providers out there that enable that so we can still feel part of each other's environments and, and, and events is going to be critical. And, and I think there'll be new applications. There'll be other things that we haven't thought of yet that'll be forced to be invented, and it's all going to reside on these networks that we have. Yes. I agree with that and what Octavio said. Um, if we just bring it on home to supply chain, which has been mentioned multiple times now, you know, supply could be the data or the content or the physical material, uh, whatever that is, uh, and the chain itself. Uh, are the networks um, and in our world those are submarine networks those are the terrestrial networks and the places where they meet um, mm -hmm. so we're responsible for creating building and maintaining all of that chain so that everyone else can live in blissful ignorance <laughs> as to yeah. what it is that is <laughs> it it, but we can all still be our, be together virtually virtually doing business, virtually socializing. I will say though, Gil, um, it's gonna be really hard to feel like you're in Hawaii if you're not in Hawaii. <laughs> I, can just imagine, uh, I can just imagine Rosemary with a, with a Mai Tai standing on the deck in yeah, yeah. Mai Tai or something. I don't know, I don't know that's cool. Cool. Super cool. You know, you can mess a lot, Gil, but being in New yeah. Jersey, and February, yeah. you know, January is not not going to feel I mean, like it. Yeah. Screens and big room heaters to feel like we're in Hawaii. Yeah. But it, it might be needed because I we're going to go. I, nuts. I think it drives the local the lo a little bit of localism again. I know that's difficult for a global event, but yeah, you might get events in the in the coming year or two where there's three or four centers that are connected together by some amazing broadcasting functionality. But uh, I think I mean we just we just come out of the back of a of a virtual ITW, which has had some attendance and it's had some good panel sessions, not unlike the kind of thing we're doing now. You know those things actually I think you you find get more attendance by being virtual than being physical. Um, yeah, but it's you hard know, to replace the, the, the networking and meeting when there's not a volume of people. I've seen the future in a couple of the deals that I'm in, one of them is Dreamview Studios. And amongst other things, they're you know, CGI experts, the guys that like created Jurassic Park. So yeah. they, they're building really interesting uh, digital double technology um, avatars. And if you look at um, Unreal Engine 5 right now, what that yeah. is and what Fortnite is and what that's becoming, um, with this yep. whole current situation of remoteness, uh, I think in the not too distant future, you'll have a digital double of yourself attending uh, virtual conferences in uh, Fortnite, Unreal Engine 5 or 10, whatever uh, environment that you could program with AI to say, go out and sell some subsea capacity. And then you get like a text on your phone, not virtual Nigel just did a deal. <laughs> yeah. While you're sitting <laughs> in the top, right? yeah. yeah, yeah, Hunter. I'm not sure we can. Uh, we want duplicates of ourselves here, but I can. I can certainly. I can certainly say this: that you know, I think that a lot of services that get provided are underappreciated, right? And a lot of things are. Right? Well, the conferences are underappreciated, right? People miss conferences. The the speed of connectivity from your home is underappreciated because people just expect it to work. Your cell phone is expected to work but a lot of the infrastructure it goes underappreciated and you only realize it when you don't have it and i think one of the benefits of this right this entire pandemic and where we are is that the the investment community i think realizes how important the infrastructure is the global infrastructure for for staying connected globally um and i think that's gonna i i, I do think that a, a, as a result of this you'll probably see some additional investments in the business as it relates to infrastructure, making sure people are connected globally. Hopefully um, that's reflected in an increase in the EBITDA multiples for our respective businesses. <laughs> <laughs> Hope so. Well, and a lot of those, and a lot of the um, 
requirement then is going to be to do vertical integration of all those pieces and make it all work together so it is seamless and people can push a button and get a great webinar. Yep. I didn't, um, all right. So um, well, that's creativity. Okay. Creativity is a really difficult thing to do remotely. That's that's where I think we we're going to have a problem because all the creative deals that we that we spin when we actually talk to each other are, are very difficult to try and do remotely. It's a bit like the film industry. I have a friend in the film industry. They they can't make that work. It needs to be organic and squashed together and sharing cups of coffee and you know the little sparks that that create the the beautiful sort of you know realm of the of the finished movie or or whatever it is it, it, to right. try and do you can you can make a facsimile of it but it's 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 not 3d it's kind of it, it's a clear facsimile yeah, yeah. and I, I think you're right and that's a good place to end i know carl's kind of giving us the sign but um there really isn't any substitute for being face to face and you know having human interaction i don't i don't think at least at least and i think part of it is generational i think younger people are more um you know interested in in being online with other people and not having that as much human interaction as we have uh, may not feel the same but um anyway that was a great discussion thank you all for um your input and um carl back to you Thank you, Rosemary. Yes, and, and thank you to everyone for your insights um, on how we're rebuilding communications in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, once again, our all-star panelists, Bill Santelise, NJFX, Hunter Newby, Newby Ventures, Joe Scatterigia, Windstream, Octavio Hernandez, Gold Data, Nigel Bailiff, Aquacoms, and a big thank you to our guest moderator, Rosemary Cochran, principal and co-founder of Vertical Systems Group, for keeping us on point today. Just a quick reminder, our speakers are staying on for the remainder of the lunch hour to answer any more of your questions on LinkedIn. Just search for hashtag JSA virtual roundtables or click the direct link in the chat box to continue the Q&A. And viewers, if you were one of our first 100 registrants, we hope you enjoyed your lunch. Go ahead and visit us at jsa.net to register for upcoming JSA virtual roundtables including our next one on July 30th, examining how we can safeguard our network infrastructure in today's brave new world. That's a wrap. Look out for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and more. In the meantime, see you over on LinkedIn. Happy networking and stay safe. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all.